she was able to be engaged and involved in a way that worked for her and her physiology at the time. Now, I'm so happy to say she's in remission, and now they come out every single year on the anniversary of her remission date to have a really fun orgy. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their funny, sexy, and fascinating stories as they take us on their journey. We always strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy and positive approach to non-monogamy. However, everyone approaches it a little differently, and at its core, our show is about hearing, highlighting, and learning from the different experiences and approaches people have. With that in mind, it is important to remember that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of our own. So sit back, relax, and just accept the fact that your time with us will be spent in an awkward turmoil of laughter and arousal. We should also let you know that this podcast will hopefully include some explicit language. If that kind of thing offends you, we suggest you keep listening until it no longer does. If you're under 18, you either need to stop listening or go get your parents and you can listen as a family. The choice is yours. Enjoy. Welcome to episode 21. It's not a Wednesday. Special bonus episode. Yeah, we're releasing a special bonus episode, and that's because today we have an interview with Alice Little, and she reached out to us a few weeks ago regarding coming on the podcast. We were really, really excited about this interview since she is the number one booking legal sex worker in the United States states and works at the Moonlight Bunny Ranch in Nevada. She is a sex workers' rights advocate, sexologist, and sex educator who has presented at 50 kinks globally. Over 50 kink events. Over 50 kink events. I don't know what a kinks globally is. <laughs> you know what I meant. <laughs> anyway, the, the other reason that we wanted to get it out earlier rather than later, and, and that we're releasing it on a Monday, um, part of that is we talk about some legislation, some pending legislation that's going to be on the ballot in November in Nevada or in their county in Nevada. Yeah. And we wanted to get the information out there, but we didn't want to bump other people who are already scheduled to be released. So we figured we'd just do a double whammy this week. And yeah. we actually have another one later in the week on Wednesday, the normal day, with uh, Tristan and Bowie from Two Married Sluts. And we talk about relationships and all sorts of stuff with them. They recently started a podcast and are both professional companions. So we, and, and they're swingers and poly uh -huh. and all sorts of good stuff. So we get to talk a little bit more about that side of things with two other sex workers later in the week. So it's a fun sex work week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Today, when we talk with Alice, um, we talk about everything from the sex work legislation to Bluetooth security, sex, safe, sex, <laughs> sex safety. Favorite sex toys. Yeah. Pro how she uh, sees couples. Yeah, product safety, um, safety strategies for group sex. So there's a ton of good stuff in here, including the fact that she herself identifies as polyamorous, and we, we talk about that a little bit. So it's a, it's a pretty awesome conversation we have with her. You're going to want to give it a listen. One of the things that we were hoping that we could ask of you is um, because there's some legislation that's pending and apparently, and she'll talk a little bit about this, but apparently they put this um, on the ballot even though they didn't receive enough signatures. So the commission- In Nevada, correct. In, well, in in their county in Nevada. Right. So the, the Board of Commissioners for Lyon County, um, she sent us- a link that we put in the show notes and all of their names and email addresses are in there. So what we were wondering is maybe if you would be willing to send, just take a minute and send one or a few of these commissioners a link with our show notes to say, Hey, listen, listen to all the amazing things that Alice and the other sex workers do for the community, for people, the way that they change lives. We talk a lot about the way that she and other of her coworkers change lives around the world. So if, if you just have an extra minute this week or next week or in the next month, just take them, take a minute, send them a message, a short message and try to get them to listen to maybe see why taking this off the ballot or, or not doing anything about it would be right. a great idea. Cause they're trying to shut the bunny ranch down and, and all of the brothels and in all the better. brothels in this County. So that's our that's our one call to action that we would give to you today, if yeah. you don't mind. 
Again, to get to those links for the commissioners, you can find them in the show notes, which are on our website at normalizingnonmonogamy.com, or you can also find them in the notes of your podcast player, the description for our this episode. So we'll quit rambling now and jump into the interview, and we'll see you on the other side. Well, thanks, Alice, for joining us. We appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to chat with us this evening, and we've been really excited about this interview, so I think it'll be a great time. We wanted to start things off uh, just asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, it's something that we found, especially when non-monogamy, we, we tend to, people tend to think we're one-dimensional and all we do is have sex with other people or date other people, so... I think maybe having people hear that you're a sex worker, that they maybe would assume the same, that that's all you do with your life. And we we were poking around your Twitter and noticed a lot of reading, exercise, hiking. And so do you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself? Of course. You figure that I was born in Ireland and I kind of had this storybook type of childhood where I grew up surrounded by animals in the great outdoors. It gave me this really unique appreciation for life, for animals, and for nature. And it's really carried over to a lot of my hobbies today. I find myself spending a whole bunch of time horseback riding, hiking, just getting out and enjoying life and all that there is to do. Especially out here in Nevada, it's so scenic and beautiful that it's it would seem silly to not take advantage of all the great trails available to us here. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like reading is also at the top of your list. Do you have maybe a couple of favorites that you're digging into right now? Oh gosh, don't make me pick just one. Um, <laughs> I just finished. I just finished reading a Steve Sims book, Blue Fishing, which is a fantastic, fantastic read. It's very informative in terms of how to make things happen, and how at the end of the day, it's really all about communication, which huh. I find to be quite true in all fields. Yeah, perfect. So, your list of. of- qualifications on your website and that you kind of listed out in your email f- to us is is quite heavy and we we covered most of them in our intro for you but um you know beyond that do you do you mind sharing with us how you got into sex work and maybe what that journey looked like for you So I started primarily as a sex educator. When I was younger, I had an amazing opportunity to work at a pro dungeon in New York City. And there I received a ton of really good high-end education in terms of things like consent and negotiations, as well as the BDSM skills that go along with those activities. Through that work, I started being invited to teach my own classes at all sorts of different events across the country, and I ended up becoming fairly well known for this. From there, I connected with an individual that was working at the Bunny Ranch at the time, and she invited me out for a couple of weeks to see if I would like it. I decided to take her up on the offer, and then in November 2015, I started out at the Sagebrush Ranch, and there I've been ever since. So, so, bef- me. Before- yeah. <laughs> so before sex work, I mean, was that something you always knew you wanted to do or was there other careers that you were, you had dreamed of doing as you grew up and, and this is sort of something you found along the way? There's this really funny and embarrassing piece of paper from preschool and it says, when I grow up, I want to be, and it's a blank space where you can then write your answer. In all my three-year-old wisdom, I wanted to be a cat when I grew up. That was my big ambition. (laughs) So in terms of careers, I kind of have tried my hand at a whole bunch of different things. I've been an EMT in New York. I've been a BDSM educator. I've worked in cell phone sales. Just a huge laundry list of different careers, trying to find something that actually gave my life purpose. When I work a job, I don't want to just be doing a function of something. I actually want to be contributing to society in a meaningful way. For the first time ever through my work at the Bunny Ranch, I felt like I actually was making a difference in people's lives. Right. Yeah, and I think maybe that's, when people hear that, that's almost counterintuitive. Do you mind talking a little bit about just what, I guess, how that is and what type of differences you've made? Well, 
the way I look at it is that sex for so many people, and really intimacy more so than sex, is a need rather than a want or desire. It's such a prevalent need that it's actually included on Maslow's hierarchy of needs pyramid, which is oftentimes referenced in psychology. I mm-hmm. do reference that because it talks about how important it is to have that sense of intimacy and closeness with families, friends, and loved ones in order to progress through life and become fully self-actualized. Well, if we're acknowledging that from a psychological standpoint, it seems only natural that we should actually explore what the service of intimacy looks like in practice. And the answer is it looks like legal sex work at the Bunny Ranch. Right. But I think maybe that's something else we wanted to ask about is there's a lot of discussion right now around the legalities around sex work. And and maybe that some people aren't even aware that sex work is legal in certain parts of our country. So in, in one of your credentials is number one booking legal sex worker in the U.S. So do you mind talking a little bit about what legal sex work is and what it looks like and what that looks like in the U.S. today? Before I can really get into the specifics of legal sex work, it's important to first talk about sex work as an umbrella term. Because oftentimes when we talk about sex work, we don't really have a conception of what that truly is in practice. A sex worker can be anything from an educator to a full-service provider to a phone sex operator to somebody working at a strip club. There is a huge spectrum in the world of sex work, and it isn't just limited to the legal side of things, which happens at the Bunny Ranch. What I do at the Bunny Ranch is a form of sex work called legal sex work. With that, it means that we have laws and legislation in place that allows us to provide full-service sex to our clients in a capacity that's safe, legalized, and, well, kind of fantastic and fun. (laughs) (laughs) And I think think maybe just to expand really quick, you you mentioned some other forms, which, you know, phone sex and, and stripping, and those are also legal sex work. I guess the difference between what you do at the bunny ranch and those is that you would actually have physical contact penetrative intercourse with another human correct Uh, another way that's oftentimes used to describe that is to call it full service sex work and i further quantify that by saying it's legal full service sex work Mm -hmm. because it's very important that we differentiate between the legal safe industry and what is unfortunately an eagle an illegal and unregulated industry that does absolutely exist in this country as well a lot of people Mm -hmm conflate the two and they don't understand that there's a difference between the laws and legislation that keep us safe and sound at the bunny ranch versus this Hollywood painted caricature of what they think a sex worker should be, which is this woman in five inch tall heels walking down in skimping clothing on some back alleyway. We could not be any further different from that. It's such a harsh portrayal And an incredibly inaccurate one, too, like many other types of Hollywood stereotypes. Yeah. I think one thing we wanted to uh, branch off on, I guess, from this discussion is there's a heated heated debate right now about whether sex work should be legalized or decriminalized. Can you talk about your thoughts on that and pros and cons of each and where you fall? So there's a couple different types of legalization that are being discussed right now in the media. The first is legalization, which is what we have at the Bunny Ranch and the associated Nevada brothels. Through that system, it's only legal within certain counties and only legal at those particular locations. The ladies have to be affiliated with one of those locations in order to be able to work legally. Another form that is being discussed of legalization is called decriminalization, which is where we simply remove all of the legislation that would prevent someone from being a sex work rather than actually enacting a legal system of sex work. Through a decriminalized system, the ladies would not have to be affiliated with a ranch. There would not be any laws or legislation regarding how she conducts her business, what kind of health requirements there are, and it would be very much so free open market style. And then you have outright criminalization, which is calling for the removal of both the legal brothel system as well as the prevention of any sort of decriminalized system from coming into play. 
right now in America, what we have here is legalized prostitution only within the Nevada brothel system. We don't have a system of decriminalization at all whatsoever. Instead, we absolutely do go after those who are providing services illegally outside of the ranches. The biggest benefit of having legalization is that it gives us protection. It gives us legislation and safety measures. It gives us directive as to what kind of health requirements should there be. How are we going about doing and conducting background checks? How are we making sure that everyone is entering this industry consensually? How do we guarantee that everyone is of a legal age? And the way that we do that at the Bunny Ranch is we actually have to go and apply for a working license at the sheriff's office. We have to give our fingerprints, all of our legal information, and consent to a full background check before we're ever able to show up to a lineup and start working. Whereas with the criminalized way of doing things, which does exist in America, oftentimes it's called independent or illegal type sex work that unfortunately isn't nearly as safe and isn't nearly as regulated. As a result, you do have a system that does allow for exploitation. Personally, I am for nationwide legalization, which would look like having systems like the Bunny Ranch in every single state in America. Long term, I do believe we could have national level decriminalization, but I think it's going to take some time for society to get over that stigma and legalization is really going to be that first step. Like Mm -hmm. you had mentioned, right now, it's being so hotly debated that even what we already have legal is being very hotly contended. We've got a petition going right now that's looking to seek to close the Bunny Ranch and is essentially holding my career hostage. So you you see legalization as a stepping stone to decriminalization, is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think that we need to redefine how we relate with sex and treat sex workers in America before we could ever roll out any sort of decriminalization at a national level. We've got to be realistic and look at the fact that we can't even have acceptance of the legal system we have. It's, unrealist- it's unrealistic to try to advocate for complete and total decriminalization when we can't even keep the legal status that we have. Yeah. Right. Right. Do you mind talking a little more about the petition that's going on in Nevada right now? There is a group called No Little Girl that started a petition a number of months ago seeking to put a question on the ballot come November in regards to whether the county should allow for legal prostitution or not. This group actually failed to collect enough signatures, but they were able to negotiate with the commissioners to get the question put on the ballot as an advisory question anyway. So come November, this question of should the brothels remain legal, it will absolutely be on the ballot. Um, I struggle with the fact that they did not actually collect enough signatures, which tells me that the people stand behind us and they want us to be there. Why in the world would the commissioners choose to put this advisory question on the ballot and essentially hold over 500 working ladies and 200 employees essentially fiscally hostage? Right. Yeah, I mean, right. come come November, what's what's going to happen? If the Bunny Ranch closes, the end result is all of us are out of our jobs. And it's not like there's a booming economy here in Mount House, Nevada, where these high figure jobs are just floating out there in the economy ready to be scooped up. They're they're simply not there. And so they're actually not just hurting us, but they're also hurting the economy in so many ways in the sense that they're taking jobs out of the market. They're removing taxation dollars from the local area. And it's really problematic that they didn't examine what the impact of this petition or I guess now advisory question truly is. And and also for anybody who's interested in trying to help maybe not allow that ballot um, petition to go through, yeah. are there any is there anything that you would recommend people do to, to try and help support you and, and your yeah, colleagues? Yes, since, since the, it's coming up in November. Yes, what I can do is give you guys the email addresses for the different commissioners because ultimately the question is that is on the ballot – 
That is just an advisory question. The end decision remains in the hand of the commissioners. So for those that are wanting to show support for me, the Bunny Ranch, and legal sex work, the best thing you could do is write a heartfelt letter to those commissioners explaining to them why you stand with the Bunny Ranch and why you believe that we need legal sex work to remain legal. Doing that is incredibly helpful because, as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes my voice goes unheard. They're not interested in hearing from me, the sex worker. They want to hear from you guys, the public. So if everyone's willing to take a few minutes out of their day, write a couple of emails, it would seriously mean the world to me because that's what's going to let me continue to do what I do. Excellent. Well, we'll make sure we put those in the show notes for sure. Yeah, so if anyone wants to reach out and write letters, they will be there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I imagine, too... I know one of the things that comes up a lot when people are petitioning or lobbying against sex work is that it leads to and um, reinforces trafficking and human trafficking. And I've and we've heard a lot of arguments against that, that it's quite the opposite, that, that legalized sex work is actually one of the best ways to fight human trafficking. What are, I guess, where do you fall on that? And and maybe do you have some examples of how legal sex work has impacted trafficking in the U.S. Mm -hmm. or worldwide? First off, we have to talk about where human sex trafficking is happening. And it primarily is not happening here in the United States. That isn't to deny that there are some instances of here of it here, but by and large, most of the sex trafficking issues that we're hearing about are happening in countries like Thailand and Cambodia, places in which there are absolutely no regulations, where there's not a lot of human rights in general. Here in the States, trafficking does occur as well, and there is no denying that. However, we also have to talk about what human sex trafficking is. Most often, it looks like someone being kidnapped or coerced and manipulated into a situation in which they are non-consenting and forced to have sex with other people for money that will then be taken from them by the pimp or handler or whomever is taken essentially ownership of that individual. That's absolutely appalling. And unfortunately, one of the ways in which that happens is a lack of sex education in this country. I believe very, very strongly that because we don't know how to have sex, because we don't know about consensual sex, that it creates this very permissive culture as a whole for for such abuses to happen. When you look at the Bunny Ranch and the legalized system that we have there, one of the ways that we fight back against sex trafficking is having the ladies choose to work for us. We don't send out Bunny Ranch Airlines to go pick anybody up. The ladies actually have to come to us themselves. They have to fly or drive or take a bus. They have to get themselves to the property. Once they're at the property, they then have to choose to go to the doctor. That's that's a choice. No one is going to drag you out of your room, kicking and screaming, and put you in the doctor's office. You have to voluntarily choose to go to the doctor. Additionally, you have to voluntarily choose to go to the sheriff and choose to fill out that paperwork and choose to essentially do the background check. All of those things are choices. It gives someone an opportunity that if they've been pressured, coerced, forced, or otherwise are uncomfortable with the situation to be able to speak up and say something. By having the legal system in place, we create the opportunity for sex work to happen in a way that is safe, is legal, and is consensual. Sex work oftentimes is considered the oldest profession in the world, and that's an accurate statement. We have proof going all the way back to Assyro-Babylonian times of sex workers working within the ziggurats and the temples. There's always been sex work, and there always will be sex work. And so the best defense we have is to legalize sex work, regulate sex work, so this way it can operate in a way that's safe, legal, and consensual. Building on that a little bit, if somebody wanted to seek out a sex worker, how would you, or do you have any advice for them in determining whether the woman is 
being uh, is under duress at all or being coerced into the situation. Um, I think a lot of people want to seek out sex workers, but they're worried about that. They want the woman to be in a safe situation and be there willingly. The easiest way is to go to a legal brothel. And that's not to say that the Bunny Ranch is the only place in the world with a legal brothel system. Australia actually has a very thriving community of various brothels that exist, as does New Zealand. I, I want to say that there's a number of other European countries, such as Germany, that have legalized systems available, too. When you choose to go to a licensed legal location, you're choosing to buy into that system of legality, that system of consent. The way to avoid exploitation and avoid potentially interacting with an individual that's not consenting would be to simply go to a legalized location. That's what they're there for. The easiest... Uh, uh, I imagine, though... Mm -hmm. um, Right, so, to my knowledge, the, the only place in the U.S. that legalized brothels exist is in Nevada. Is that true? Yes, that is correct. It's only in select counties of Nevada. And at this time, no new counties have legalization on the ballot. And so so for somebody who maybe doesn't have the financial capacity or the time, if, if they wanted to have a recurring situation with a sex worker to either fly to Nevada or Australia or New Zealand, are there any suggestions you have for people who are seeking out a professional but want to make sure that that person is not not taking part in this against their own will? Um, well, first, I can't really encourage anyone to do illegal activities such as seeing a sex worker outside of a legal brothel. Instead, what I would do is encourage somebody to perhaps work with a cam girl work with one of the other forms of sex work services that are available, such as phone sex providers, dominatrices. There's a lot of options out there for people to get their intimate needs met without having to go to the illegal side of things. Really, the only way you know 100% that it's safe and consensual is going to be to go through a legalized brothel as far as full service sex work goes. Mm -hmm. Sure. There's a, there really is no 100% definitive, let's say litmus test to determine if somebody is or is not trafficked other than are they working within a legal brothel. The reason why I cite cam girls as being a fantastic option for those seeking to have a one-on-one -on -one intimate encounter is that you can go through the communication, the connection, except that you're not doing it physically. You're just having that same interaction virtually. It's perfectly legal. You're perfectly safe. And again, through that way, you know that the lady has chosen to contact you, chosen to connect with you, and chosen to engage in those activities. There really isn't this concern in regards to camming as far as coercion goes there's a much more consensual side of that it's a much more thorough and legalized market in the sense that it's safe to say that most cam girls you engage with are choosing to be cam girls yeah no that's uh that makes perfect sense and i think that's good advice yeah i think it's a great recommendation um so one one thing we kind of wanted to shift the conversation a little bit to your work with couples and or people, not necessarily couples, but people who are interested in the non-monogamous side of things. And I think one thing that we've heard from people is that, you know, maybe they wanted to open their relationship and the, the way that they thought would be a safe way to do that would be to go and seek out a sex worker because they, they're not concerned that she's going to try to steal, or he, I guess, is going to try to steal their partner. But on the flip side, I think their concern is that it's not a, a real, genuine interaction, that because there's money exchange, the emotions that you have are not true or not, not genuine. So do you mind talking a little bit about how you... I guess how you work with other couples and and what your emotional sort of drive is behind this and, and whether or not that's a true assumption. Um, I would say it's an incorrect assumption to say that it's a disingenuous engagement when you see a sex worker as part of a threesome encounter or as part of an extramarital curriculum. Um, 
you figured there's this interesting term called bounded intimacy, which talks about there being genuine affections and genuine feeling, genuine compassion, but all within this framework pre-negotiated time generally the the time that we would spend together at the ranch. Within that realm, within the space we've created, everything that's happening within there is absolutely real and genuine. Much in the same way that if you were to see a mental health professional, they genuinely care about your well-being and your health and how your day is going. At the same time, everybody engaged in the activity consensually knows that at a certain point, this experience will end. It is within this frameworked time and Thus, we all go on with our daily lives. Right, but at the same time, you you truly want to be there. You're truly engaged. You you feel the intimacy. You, I mean, all of these feelings for you are real. They're not they're not imagined because there was money exchanged. Absolutely so. Um, frankly speaking, the money is not my primary motivator for being at the ranch. Everyone has a different motivation for showing up to work every day. And mine is not money. My motivation is getting to meet people and getting to connect with them. I think that the purpose of life is to connect with others and enrich their lives as much as humanly possible. That's what gives us an amazing experience in life. So to me, my work at the Bunny Ranch is the most perfect way imaginable to connect with a huge diverse range of people. I see couples, I see men, I see virgins, I see females, I see lesbians, I see people of color, I see trans individuals. It really is a huge spectrum that comes and spends time with me and as such it really allows me to grow and develop as a person. So for those who would be concerned about the like the fiscal aspect of it and the fact that there is a transaction happening as the end all be all of disingenuous or genuous, you have to look at the reason of why I am there. And right. I'm there because I want to be. Financially, yeah. I could retire tomorrow, not look back and be very comfortable for the rest of my life. It's a right. choice for me every single day to be there. I <clears throat> Something that most people can't say about their jobs, but I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough to say about mine. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important parallel to draw that, you know, most people, if they won the lottery tomorrow, they probably, well, they might go into work just to tell some people off and then they wouldn't go in the next day. But (laughs) it sounds like if that were to happen to you, you would continue on just like you are today because it's what you actually enjoy doing. You're not just there for the money. And I think. I think that's an important thing for people to mm-hmm. hear. Mm-hmm. Working at the Bunny Ranch is my big lottery prize. Getting to be there is the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And it's those connections that are so incredibly meaningful and important to me. Yeah. I wanted to know, how do you handle situations when you, um, I guess, varying, varying people with varying experience levels, like sexual experience levels. So I know you mentioned virgins just now, um, or people who might be on the autism spectrum or people who have had like a bad relationship with sex in the past. Um, how do you handle those types of situations? I handle them through communication. Everything starts with a conversation. We talk about why somebody is there. We actually look at the reasons of what are they wanting to accomplish. Are they hoping to learn something? Are they hoping to have a positive experience? And then we'll also talk a little bit about where they have been, such as any past traumas that I might need to be aware of, any lack of education in terms of someone being a virgin and never getting to be intimate with someone. And from there, I'll kind of take a look at where they are, where they want to be, and I'll develop a plan to help bring them to that point in time. Oftentimes, I will infuse sex education in my experiences in such a way that they don't even realize that you're actually learning something while having an amazing encounter, too. It's things like pausing before putting a condom on and talking somebody through what I am doing and how to do it. It's things like, oh, we're using this type of lube because it's a water-based lube, which is compatible with commons with condoms. Make sure that you do not use silicone lube because that can damage condoms. I actually explain what it is I'm doing and why I am doing it. So this way they have that information to really take home and improve their own sex lives beyond the bunny ranch. Right. And maybe for for somebody out there who was thinking about 
maybe there's a listener who is on the autism spectrum or who has a disability of some kind, and they're concerned that they could never get into to non-monogamy because they struggle with uh, one-on-one relationships or with any type of relationships. Do you mind maybe sharing some experiences you've had with people that you've seen transitions or breakthroughs or things happen that like the way that you've changed somebody's life for the better, just maybe to give somebody who's listening like, oh, the, the, it's I'm not doomed forever to be alone and, and not, or I could do something like non-monogamy, which is something that a lot of people struggle with without any of those limiting factors, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So the way that I would kind of go about doing it is when I connect with somebody, oftentimes we'll talk about what kind of a relationship we're wanting to build. Is this a a one-time occurrence or will this be an ongoing thing? Oftentimes for those that are looking to get somewhere in their sex journey, it looks like having several dates together. So let's just say a virgin. Our very first encounter is going to be focused on the skills. It's going to be focused on the activity. The second one, we might go out on a date together and I'm going to talk them through some best tips for date advice, ideas for little presents that they could get a girl that might charm her, how to compliment a woman eloquently rather than just saying, hey, I like your butt. I'll oftentimes work with people that are on the autism spectrum to kind of change the way that they perceive sex and relationships so it's no longer a challenge for them to wrap their minds around. When you take a lot of the loaded words and phrases out of something and simply go down to the base language of describing what it is you're trying to accomplish, I find that it makes things feel very less intimidating. It's not non-monogamy, it's having relationships with more than one person in a genuine way. Well, that sounds pretty doable, so how do we do that? Well, first it starts with communication, and I'll give somebody those skills. Um, To kind of give you a specific example, I had a gentleman come to see me right around his 50th birthday following a terrible divorce. He recently had an ED condition that arose and ended up being a huge point of contention in their relationship, and he cited it as inevitably being the main reason why his relationship failed. He had gone without intimate connection for over five years before sending me an email to connect and kind of get back into the saddle. That first encounter with him was almost magical when he learned that there were different ways to have sex and other ways to do things. It opened up a completely new world for him. During our second meeting, we actually sat and set up a dating profile for him on Tinder, and I took a few snapshots that looked really cute to set him all up, and even now, he'll send me text messages going, oh, I'm going on a date, how do I look? And I'll be like, look great, buddy, get him, you got this. (laughs) It's so much fun getting to see that growth in people, and that change absolutely is possible. I'm not going to lie to any of the listeners out there and say that it doesn't require some hard work on your own part because you have to want that kind of change in your life. I can't, nor can anyone, make that change for you. However, if you want it, I can certainly assist and facilitate that. Right. Yeah, I I guess so. It sounds like you've seen some pretty amazing transitions. I was was curious, and this is just um, more of a fun question. Have you ever had a a sexual encounter with a client that you were just sort of like it blew you away like you you know I I think we've all had those times where we've had sex with somebody and you got done and you were just like laying there and you you couldn't believe it was that good I imagine that's probably happened at least once throughout your career oh absolutely yes Sometimes we have gentlemen that come that look for really these life-changing, mind-blowing type experiences, these kinds of sex bucket list items. I had a gentleman request for me and five ladies to join him for a scenic drive around the Lake Tahoe in a limousine. And then we pulled the limousine around behind the ranch and then proceeded to have an orgy in the limousine. And that was such a wild and fun experience. And it was something that kind of happened spur of the moment, too. We started with the fun trip around the limo. And then I was like, hey, why go inside when we could just have some fun in the limo? And we went for it. And it ended up being just absolutely incredible. Hmm. Sounds like a good birthday idea. Yeah. 
Write, 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 it, write it down. I'll yeah, take some notes. Write that one down. <laughs> just, just add it to the bucket list. Yeah. Thank you. We have things at the Bunny Ranch that simply don't exist anywhere else. Like, we have an amazing heated pool available for topless pool parties. Completely nude pool parties. You want to have sex poolside? Cool. We can do that. Mm-hmm. Where, where else in America does that get to happen? Literally nowhere else. It's in so many ways adult Disneyland, and we really specialize in creating these really unique sex encounters for people. Yeah. Right. It sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> mm, it really is. It's such an enjoyable line of work, and it's it, my job is pleasure, pleasure and enjoyment, and it blows my mind that people have this misconception about coercion and that this is somehow a low part of my life, when in all reality, I've never been happier. Right. Yeah. You mentioned that you talk, you know, you do work with couples. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that looks like when you, when, I guess, why couples come to you? You know, are they looking for a third? Are they looking for relationship co- uh, coaching? Are they interested in some guidance in sleeping with other people? There's a few different reasons as to why somebody would choose to see me as part of a couple. The first reason could be to repair their own relationship. If they're having sex difficulties, relationship difficulties, they may come to me to be an outside perspective and perhaps give some hands-on coaching and show them, hey, this isn't working because you kind of forgot foreplay. Ladies, we, we do take a little bit longer to get started than guys do. And so it's important that you actually take a full 15 minutes for foreplay So this way your partner is physically ready to be engaged at the same level that you as the male partner are. Oftentimes that comes up during my session with couples. Another reason why somebody may see a sex worker as part of a couple is to have a safe threesome encounter where you don't have to worry about STDs or the other person stealing, quote unquote, your spouse. That just isn't the reality at the Bunny Ranch. Instead, we're focused on fun. Another reason why couples might come is that they want to open themselves up for perhaps a poly experience and kind of want to do poly with training wheels, which essentially means that they get to call the shots. They get to have total control of the situation. They're able to set up any boundaries and it kind of lets them test drive what that situation looks and feels like to better determine before entering a perhaps a polyamorous relationship. So one thing you mentioned a second ago was a a safe option where they don't have to worry about STIs or STDs. And I think maybe, can you expand on that? Because one one would imagine if, I think the stereotype being that because you probably have sex with a lot more people than your average Joe, that you're at an increased risk for STIs. And, and can you talk a little bit about why it's actually a safer option than people may think. At the Bunny Ranch, we are legally obligated to have a doctor check every single week for STDs and STIs. A lady is unable to actively work if she has an infection of some sort. Thus, you know 100% guaranteed if the lady is available to provide a service that she's been tested and her results came back negative. Another way in which it's safer is that condoms are required for all sex activities at the Bunny Ranch. Everything is done with protection. And as somebody who is an industry insider and is essentially a sex expert, I know how to keep myself safe, especially in a threesome encounter. Many times in threesomes, people don't think about cross-contamination between the ladies. And usually it comes from things not like penetration, but from fingers and mouths and I'm able to manage all of those risks because I'm aware of them whereas somebody going into just a random hookup a threesome at a bar may not know to look out for those things and manage those risks appropriately I'm able to handle those details so you can focus on the fun rather than the nitty gritty of oh who's doing what where and how and which and what yeah so do you use condoms then for uh, oral sex as well and other or other barriers Oh, absolutely, yes. We've got condoms, dental dams, latex, as well as latex-free for those who have latex allergies. Yeah, I think one other thing, too, I wanted to ask is you, you mentioned that one of the common ways that things are spread is not not through PIV, but rather by hands going from person to person. And I think that's a, a situation that we in the swinging world 
often find ourselves in, if we're lucky, I suppose. <laughs> or <Orgy>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe tips for people who are in that. I guess how do you manage that risk while keeping it sexy and fun and fluid without being like, okay, well, we have to stop and wash our hands or you have to do this or you have – so tips for people so that they can – Manage that risk and keep it sexy and fun and fluid. What you are going to want to do is acquire a bottle of Swiss Navy Toy and Body Cleaner. It is antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, antimicrobial. If it's alive, it's going to kill it. And it comes in a simple little squirt bottle. It's body safe, toy safe. You can use it on hands. You can use it on orifices. Absolutely anywhere that you so need for a quick clean sterilization in between partners. Another fun way to go about doing it is to have a set of antibacterial wipes by the bed that allow you to just wipe off real quick. Toss it on the side of the bed. You can clean up the trash when you're all done. But what's important is that you just do that quick swipe of your hands. Make sure that you've got everyone else's fluids off of you before then engaging with somebody else. Another neat trick can be to have the the gentleman perhaps in the middle, one lady on one side, one lady on the other side, and never the two hands shall cross sides. So this way your left hand is pleasuring one lady while your right hand is perhaps pleasuring the other. This way you know what risks are where. A really good idea, too, is to always put condoms on your sex toys. This way you have an easy way to clean them in between use. Take the condom off, give it a quick wipe down, toss another condom on, and you're good to pass the Hitachi wand on to the next participant. Yeah, Yeah. I think those are great tips, and all of them seem like, you know, they'd be pretty fluid in the moment, which is the key, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, it it requires very little conversation. You just hand the bottle to the next person. They spray their hands down real quick and onwards you go. Yeah, It's a very easy and convenient way to manage risk. There is also an amazing, amazing product out there on the market that I cannot be vocal enough about, and that is PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. This is an HIV prevention medication that is relatively new to the market. In just the last 10 years, it's been developed and very thoroughly researched, and it is 99.999% effective at preventing an HIV infection should you have exposure. It's a simple pill that's taken once a day. It has very little to no side effects. And in certain counties, they're even offering this for free to people that are in considered a risk situation. This means anyone in the LGBT community, anybody that's in the non-monogamy community, anyone that's in the sex work community, we're all considered by the government to be at a slightly elevated risk due to having more than one partner. And as such, they're making this medication available for us at extremely low or no cost. The brand name that I most often see used as PrEP is called Truvada. And your doctor may not be familiar about this. It very well may be on you to go online, Google prep, print out all of the associated information and bring that to your doctor and have that conversation with them. Our doctors, unfortunately, don't know about this because it is so new to the market. And unfortunately, there isn't necessarily covered as part of continuous education. In fact, medical professionals oftentimes are highly highly undereducated when it comes to sex and sex health. There's only three hours of sex education required to receive a medical doctor license in this country. How insane is that? Yeah, three crazy. hours. That's even for a gynecologist. Yeah, that, they're, they're, really, they're relying on our amazing sex ed program in our public schools. So, mm. yeah. Oh, you mean the one that shows you putting a condom on a banana and that's about it? I got that. I, 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 I don't remember even think that. I got that. <laughs> It, it, it unfortunate. It's so awful. Sex, sex ed in this country just could not be anywhere. It covers contraception and STDs and completely leaves out consent and pleasure, which, yeah. frankly, are the two most important things. 
things. Is everybody wanting to participate? And how do we go about having a good sexual encounter that feels amazing for everyone involved? Should yeah. that not be the focus? Why, why in the world are we lying to essentially a whole population and denying the fact that sex is pleasurable? We, we've got to we've got to do better and talk about this stuff. There's no reason not to. Yeah, and, and beyond that, promoting abstinence is a way to prevent th- prevent pregnancy, to prevent disease. I mean, it's just it's just insane. Yeah, <laughs> so, we know that. it doesn't work. The research shows that it doesn't work. The facts and statistics around high school pregnancies are proof pudding that it doesn't work. Abstinence isn't the answer. We simply have to do better when it comes to education in this country. And frankly, for many adults who missed out on that sex education, it unfortunately falls on us to provide ourselves with that education and really seek it out. Those opportunities aren't just there. You have to almost make those opportunities for yourself. And one way that people choose to do that is to seek out the service of a legal sex worker. Right. Yeah. So on, on that same vein, are you continually keeping up in terms of what's coming out, the new, uh, the, the latest and greatest in terms of it sounds like you're on top of the, the conversation around prep and, and different things? Are you continuing your education uh, constantly to make sure that you're at the cutting edge of what information you can then give to your, your clients? Absolutely nonstop. I'm a voracious reader and I'm incredibly passionate about sex work, sex safety, and sexual pleasure. And as such, I've subscribed to a number of different newsletters. I receive a couple of health magazines. I receive alerts, in fact, from the CDC if there should be a new STD that comes out or a super virus that comes to light. I try to make myself an industry expert in every which facet that I am possibly able, whether it be the latest sex toy technology and talking about the information security of your Bluetooth enabled sex toys to are my sex toys even body safe? Are they made with BPA or is this a product that is going to be comfortable for my body? Mm -hmm. There's so many different facets to what I do beyond just being a sex worker at the Bunny Ranch. It really has turned me into this sex industry insider in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Do you you feel that a lot of your colleagues follow a similar path? I would say that the majority do, yes. It's important to note that everyone works at the Bunny Ranch for different reasons. Some may choose to work there as a short-term career, perhaps only a couple of weeks to make a financial goal and then may choose to retire, where other ladies like myself choose to do this as a long-term career. Kind of depending on how they choose to conduct their business really dictates how involved they choose to be in this industry. For me, yeah. I'm I'm in this all the way. I'm in this with both feet, arms, legs, and shoulders. Right. <laughs> what do you find the most difficult part of your job? I know we talked a lot about the fun, but I'm curious on the other side of it. Justifying my job. It is... I spend more time justifying what I do than doing what I do. I almost struggle in so many ways with the justification and explaining that, yes, I'm choosing to do this to the point where it almost feels incredibly frustrating because people don't want to believe me. For whatever reason, we have this perception that women cannot self-advocate, especially so when it comes to female sex workers, when in all reality, we know what's best for us and our bodies because we're living it. We're doing it every day. You can trust us and listen to us when we say we want to be doing this job. We are consensually and authentically doing this for the reasons that we so choose. But instead, I'm met with a lot of skepticism and kind of almost a pushback sometimes from the media. That is honestly the hardest part of my job is just getting people to accept what it is that I do, not so much as it is doing it. Right. Yeah, the more I think of it, it's just, it's sad. It's, it's sad that that's the reality of it because I, I love my job. I mean, the things I dislike, 
things like paying taxes, I think everybody dislikes. The yeah. things I don't look forward to are like, oh, I'm going to have to, you know, organize my financial statements. Well, this kind of sucks. But any business is going to have that component to it. Right, right. I wanted to, if you don't mind, circle back to maybe couples that were looking for that, you know, third person or introducing new people and and maybe providing some advice. And I'm wondering, have you ever had a situation where a couple came to you and they were interested in a third and everybody seemed on the same page and then things started happening and then jealousy happened? Because I think that's a situation that we've seen that I think a lot of people in the world of non-monogamy have seen and maybe some tips on from you on how you've diffused those situations and maybe conversations that you would encourage people to have in the moment when things are hot, people get fired up and things aren't going the way that you thought they were going to go. So one of the important things to mention is when we first meet at the Bunny Ranch, before anything happens, we talk about it. There is a very, very thorough conversation in which I am going to ask both parties separately, what are you personally wanting to get out of this experience? What are your boundaries and limits and your comfortabilities? If that changes, here is how I would like you to communicate that. If anything makes you uncomfortable, let me know so we can talk about the feelings before they start bubbling up and, and turn into a sense of jealousy. Oftentimes, couples will come forward with this as a primary concern, like, oh, I want to do this, but I don't know how I'm going to feel about it. Well, that's the cool thing about this in the sense that we can adapt and change things so long as everybody is willing to be open and honest about their feelings and communicate them in an authentic way. I feel like there's no reason for things to get hot, heavy, and heated in the bedroom in a negative sense. The only reason anyone should be hot and sweaty in the bedroom is because they feel really damn good. And I find that by talking about communication and establishing what should the procedure look like if consent changes during the course of what we are doing, so long as you have that conversation up front so everybody knows that it's an option to say, you know, I'm not really comfortable with you kissing him, not a problem. Thank you for using your words and telling me that you feel that way. Is this okay? Is that okay? And then I will seek confirmation from somebody so this way they know that they truly are in control of the situation. Um, the easiest advice I could give for somebody in a non-sex work situation would be to have a practice threesome with a sex worker. It's the most amazing way to kind of go through the motions of those skills and those conversations because oftentimes we don't even have those conversations with the person that we're primarily in a relationship with, let alone a third person. So it's really about learning those skills in the first place and by gaining those skills, you're kind of able to prevent those negative situations from happening. Of course, that's an ideal world. Realistically, not everyone is self-aware, and you may inevitably, despite going into things authentically from your own thought, may find that another person engaged in that situation has changed their mind and are arousing thoughts of jealousy, things of that nature. And in that kind of situation, I think it's really important to first de-escalate and bring the volume down. That usually looks like everybody putting their clothing back down, defusing the situation and being like, okay, let's put a pause on what's going on right now. Let's make some space and talk about this. Do it from a genuine way that even if the other person is heated and has completely lost their cool, if you're able to maintain that sense of calm and compassion for how they are feeling and recognizing that they're, they're having an experience, an emotional reaction to something that has occurred, if you can be self-aware and acknowledge that that other person is struggling and help support them through that struggle by remaining calm yourself, I oftentimes find that that in and of itself is an amazing way to kind of bring the temperature down a few degrees so everyone can reevaluate where they are within that particular scenario. Yeah. Sure, sure. But I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, do you have any more questions on that topic before I switch? No, but I had some other questions, but you go, go ahead. Go ahead. And I was I was curious too. I think um, one thing that, that people in the in the world generally are self conscious about themselves in terms of their bodies and in terms of their 
appearance or just so many different things about themselves. Mm-hmm. When when you look at the the spectrum of people in sex work and who are successful at, in the sex working world, I was wondering if maybe we could draw some parallels between that and who the people who are successful in swinging or polyamory and non-monogamy and that that we don't all fit into a certain mold in terms of what we look like and our personalities and that you can be successful regardless of that and and maybe what has made you so successful and set you apart from from the rest The easiest physical example I can give of success in sex work as far as being very unique and diverse individuals happens to be a very good friend of mine who is the second most successful sex worker at the Bunny Ranch, Tiara. Tiara is a six foot tall blonde Amazon. She is absolutely gorgeous. She is just like a playboy model. She's incredible. Comparatively, I am a four foot eight petite redhead from Ireland. We physically have almost nothing in common with each other. I mean, her hair is as long as I am tall, for goodness sakes. But within the sex work world, it's not what you look like. It's the substance of your character. And I think that's what's really made me so successful is the fact that I am self-aware of who I am as a person and I completely accept myself openly and honestly and I'm, I'm not afraid to have sex. I'm not afraid to be intimate with another person. You, you mentioned that people oftentimes get self-conscious about their appearances and use that as a limiting factor. But the way that I look at it is that it really doesn't matter what anybody looks like at the end of the day. Appearances can change. They're so mutable. You figure anyone could have a disaster tomorrow and become burned on 75% of their body. It doesn't mean that if you have a relationship with that person that you suddenly would stop loving them. You don't love what they look like. You love who they are. And in the sex work world, it oftentimes looks at the connection of how we relate to each other. And that connectivity, more so than, say, having a beautiful lady on your arm, is what really matters at the end of the day. And I think that's also true with non-monogamy. It's important that you're working with somebody that is compatible with you mentally and emotionally, more so than seeking out a specifically a blonde, a brunette, a redhead, or an Asian lady. That's the completely wrong way to go about doing things. And so I always recommend for people to take image out of the equation. Even when looking at a sex worker, read the description, how the lady describes herself. Get to know her through social media rather than looking at pictures of her because we're not objects. We're not purchasable merchandise like a Louis Vuitton handbag is on a website. Instead, there's so much more to us. There's depth and breadth and characters, personal preferences, likes and dislikes. We're these fully actualized human beings, just like everyone else is. And when we start to have a deeper appreciation of who somebody is rather than what they look like, I think that's when you get to have a really successful threesome. <laughs> I think that's great advice. hmm yeah, no, There's, for sure. It's, it kind of kills me a little bit that people get so wrapped up in the image and the appearance of things. But it, I, I find that it just it matters so little. When I talk to the couples that have been together 20, 30 years, 50 years even, they're not worried about each other's appearance anymore. That's not what keeps a relationship together long term. It's who you are. It's how they connect and interact with each other, how they communicate, how they are able to just exist in a space together harmoniously. And as a threesome, of course, that might be more of a short-term experience or perhaps a more long-term encounter in terms of a polyamorous relationship. But again, that compatibility should come first before images and appearances. Mm -hmm. Switching topics a little bit, I wanted to ask you, um, I know you you did tell us you were polyamorous, and I wanted to ask, how do you navigate that with the world, uh, with your job? And um, also in general, how do people who are sex workers navigate their personal relationships? Well, I guess maybe to build on that, too, I think one of the knee-jerk reactions would be, why would anybody want to date a sex worker? Yeah. And, and maybe what are some of the benefits that you feel 
that being a sex worker allows you to bring to relationships? I think it's a really interesting question as far as why would anyone want to date a sex worker? I almost would first counter that question with a question of my own. Well, why would anybody want to date a policeman or a fireman or a doctor or a therapist? Why would you want to be in a relationship with a prison guard? Because you care about who they are as a person. I am not my job title, nor is a cop their job title, nor is a prison guard, a prison guard theirs. We're individuals beyond what we do for a living. Sex worker isn't all that defines me. I am so much more than my career. And I would certainly hope that anyone I was pursuing a relationship with would be able to see all the multiple facets that go into comprising who I am. Um, a lot of my coworkers are in long-term relationships. Some are polyamorous. Some are in monogamous, committed, married relationships. There is a lesbian couple that actually works within the sex work world together, which is utterly fascinating, by the way. There's yeah, that's amazing. So many different relationships. In, in fact, I've actually dated one of my coworkers before. That honestly has been one of the most fulfilling relationships for me because they understand a lot of the the stigma that comes along with the job and of course you're in the career you're not going to be causing somebody stigma if well you do that job too yeah <laughs> right i think maybe it's the the easy counter to your argument and and i'm playing devil's advocate here i i personally don't have oh, any please problem do. myself <laughs> would be during your job every day you do things that maybe we would do intimately together after after you get home from work, right? So when you're a policeman, I don't expect you to come home from work and be a policeman in our house, but I would expect maybe you to come home and we could have sex a few nights a week or or once a week or whatever the number is. So I think the, the concern there would be that maybe by you doing that at work all day, you aren't going to want to do it when you come home. I guess maybe I should have picked therapist rather than policeman or cop. Um, a therapist, you figure they spend all day talking to people, hearing about their problems, connecting with them, coming up with solutions, being a very supportive individual in that person's life. Well, when a therapist goes home at the end of the day, I'm sure they feel like they want to break from things, but at the same time, they want to support their significant other. They want to be there to support them and come up with different ideas. Why should it be any different with sex work? Just because it's sex doesn't mean it has to be any different of a relationship than any other. It's only because we have all these unfortunately damaged ideas about sex and almost ownership in a way of the person we're having sex with that we struggle that oh sex workers couldn't have relationships well why why can't they there's no reason that they can't so long as everybody's going into the situation aware talking about any potential difficulties that may arise and then being willing to overcome any potential hurdles mm -hmm. Everybody comes home from work after a bad day and is exhausted. That's oh, true yeah. of any career yep. and job. I mean, if anything, a reason to be in a relationship with a self-worker is that I'm a lot more self-aware of how I am feeling in my own sexual needs, wants, and desires than the average Joe. Yeah, yeah. no, for sure. I, I guess maybe on the flip side, what do you feel that there are some unique challenges that being a sex worker does bring to your the relationship side of things? Of course. Um, a, a major one I hear about oftentimes from my coworkers is that they have to miss things like anniversaries or birthdays, perhaps, if they have a booking on that day. And so they may choose to put work in front of those things. Uh, again, I have to point at other jobs and say, well, that problem could also happen to a doctor you get called yeah. into surgery you got to save somebody doesn't matter if it's your anniversary you got to go save that baby it's it, it's just another way of looking at it it's another relationship challenge to overcome but i wouldn't necessarily say that it's unique to sex work okay. you figure that the things that might be potentially contentious with sex work such as sex safety and whatnot are covered under legality so those aren't really so much a concern um 
I suppose if a sex worker were to lie about their partner about what they were doing, that obviously would be incredibly problematic. But again, we're not looking at more of a standardized situation here. We almost have to cross into the realm of fantastical and unprobable situations to really find something that is so unique about sex work that it's a uniquely sex work related hurdle. Sure. It, mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess in so many ways to me, because this is my job and this is what I do, I, I don't have any of those preconceived notions surrounding sex and intimacy that makes it limited to just one person or just a couple of persons. I'm able to connect and share with multiple people in a very genuine way. Why, why limit that? Just because I have an encounter at work doesn't mean I want to have an encounter with someone at home any less or any differently. Yeah. At the moment, I do happen to be single, but that's because I choose to be. Right now, I'm focusing on my career and where things are moving in that path rather than developing a relationship. However, yeah. if I wanted to have a relationship, this job sure wouldn't stop me from doing so. Sure. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't feel like it seems uh, that you really let anything stop you from doing anything, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that would. Um, I, I honestly think that with genuine communication, most hurdles and boundaries are very easily overcome. And sometimes it's just a matter of talking about it and talking about it again and then talking about it a little bit more and then looking at it from a different way or getting an outside perspective on things. And yeah. the, relation, the reason why relationships tend to break down and fail is primarily from a communication issue. And sex workers are excellent at communication. It's a primary factor in our jobs to talk about sex on a frequent, concurrent basis. And so I've practiced that skill. I've, I've leveled it up. I put all my EXP points into my charisma. I'm good. <laughs> I can definitely handle a conversation about my needs, wants, and desires and help my partner have that kind of conversation, too. Sure. Yeah, I think that's incredible. So, so do you mind just talking a little bit about, again, you did mention you were polyamorous. Do you mind talking a little bit about that journey and your discovery of polyamory for yourself and sort of what that looked like? So I was polyamorous before I knew the word polyamory. I was dating two different girls in high school that were also dating each other because that's what we wanted to do. And so we did it. Later on, we found out that there was this whole community of polyamorous individuals that were engaging in consensual relationships with more than one person at a time. And as you know, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners know, oftentimes the polyamorous community can run parallel to some of the kink and BDSM communities because there are so few sexually aware folks out there in the world. I first really connected with the polyamory community via the BDSM community. I was teaching and doing a lot of classes within various dungeons and community spaces. And I was approached by some different polyamory conventions too, seeking out different classes and educational things. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. So your, your first relationship that was poly was with, with two other women. I think, I think that surprised me. Yeah, in high school too. I mean, most yeah. people in high school are not that mature to do that. It was, it was hard enough for me to have one relationship <laughs> in high school. <laughs> Oh, man. I was kind of a very wild teenager when it came to sexual exploration in the sense that if I wanted to try something, I, I talked with my partners about it. We decided if it was a good idea or not, and then we proceeded. It's also how I got interested in kink. It started with tying up one of those two girlfriends because she saw a picture and thought it was erotic and said, ooh, will you tie me up? I said, hmm, let me Google that real quick. Okay, I've got a five-minute tutorial. Let me do this the safe way. Got it. We got you all tied up and bound, and hey, that is kind of hot. Oh, hey. And then it kind of just went from there. Were you taught some of those communication skills, like, from growing up? And, like, or did you just know how to do them with, in exploring with those partners? Oh, God, of course I wasn't taught any of this. Where would I have learned any of these skills? There's not, like, a school for communication that exists out there. Yeah. No, all, I didn't know all of this comes... Your, yeah. If your parents, <laughs> like, helped a little bit and somehow... <laughs> 
Oh, my, my family is wonderful. They're very supportive about what I do. But of course, as a child, we didn't necessarily talk about sex all the time. However, my family did teach me to be very straightforward, honest, and communicate in a very direct and simplistic way so people can understand what it is you're trying to say and the meaning behind your words. I, I think my greater understanding of communication really came from my own research into psychology, sociology, People watching is one of my favorite things to do. Just seeing how people interact with each other and making social observations really allows you to become more self-aware of how we interact with those around us and the world around us. Right. Um, a really good, I, I guess, challenge in a way that I always encourage people to do if they're looking to get better about communication is I challenge them to have a quality conversation every single day. I define a quality conversation as being something that answers who, what, when, where, and why. You want to use those five sentence starters throughout the conversation to actually get a deeper understanding of who that person is. Like, think about the people we interact with on a daily basis and at what level we connect with them. Cashiers, check us out. We don't know their names. We get our Starbucks order. We couldn't tell you who made that drink. Why not pause for a second and be like, how's your life going? How's your day going? Tell me a little bit about you. What's your favorite drink? Why is that your favorite drink? How did you discover that? Start finding those little opportunities to start connecting in life, and you'll find that it translates over really well to your personal life as a skill. Right. I was, I was curious, uh, sort of on that transition side of things, when you're, when you're working with clients in a let, let's say a couple in a in a encounter I don't know a situation right so it's sort of a a a contained space more or less right it's a it's a safe space and then mm-hmm. how how do you help whether it's a couple or a single person maybe you're you're helping a guy who's a virgin or a woman who's a virgin navigate their first sexual experience helping them translate their experience in this safe space with you to the to the quote-unquote real world outside of that where they aren't going to have all of the variables contained oftentimes that looks like us talking about date ideas suggestions for places to go things to do what kinds of compliments are actually attractive to women rather than objectifying to women and i'll actually sit and talk about those skills while we're in that safe space so they can practice them a few times they're able to get the experience of going on a date so this way they feel more self-confident and in control of it when we enter the real world like i was talking about how virgins oftentimes will come for multiple experiences. The first time I might set up the entire date. I choose where we go to dinner. I'm going to pick a show for us to see afterwards. I'm going to be primarily in control in the bedroom, showing them the ropes as it were. Versus a second encounter, they may start volunteering some ideas of their own and it's more of a collaborative conversation about what we want to do in the experience we have. Oftentimes that final puzzle piece looks like somebody taking that initiative and setting up an experience for me. For example, I might have somebody be like, you know what, I want to take you out to dinner now, and they're going to take me to a nice restaurant, and then we're going to go see a nice movie afterwards, and I'm going to let them actually put all the skills they learned into practice. In all reality, it's like riding a bike, you're going to fall off the bike a few times. The training wheels can only stay on for so long before you've got to try to ride the bike without the training wheels. A part of the journey is overcoming those difficulties as you come across them and using them as teachable moments and educational moments for yourself. So if you have a relationship failure or a bad date, instead use it as a teaching experience. It's a lesson learned. Mm -hmm. What truly makes it a failure or a failed experience is if you don't learn from it and you don't grow from it. So long as you've learned something, gained some insight about yourself, about connection, you've grown. You've taken a step in the right direction, even through what you may perceive as an initial failure will actually be an amazing life lesson down the road. Do you also work with people in terms like, I think there's maybe the assumption that because I've paid you, now I have free reign to do whatever. 
do you work with people on making sure they're asking you for consent and working around the consent framework to help encourage that so when they're not in a situation with you that that they understand and they know like this is how I ask in a in a sexy way in a fun way to continue on the encounter without derailing it or without causing some issues before I so much as worry about making consent sexy and fun I worry about making consent consensual first and in this country we fail to even ask the basic question of is this okay are you comfortable rather than coming up with a more fanciful language and you know nice wrapping paper to put on it I encourage people to use those very straightforward words Are you comfortable with what's happening? Is this okay? Does that feel good? It gives somebody the opportunity to then speak up and say, I don't know how I feel about that. Mm, Let's try a different position. Maybe this will work better. By starting the conversation, you allow for space for that conversation to develop with the other person, especially when it comes to consent. Consent has to be a two-way sheet. It's not as simple as a checkbox of, do you want to have the sex with me? Check yes or no. That, <laughs> that's not how it works. But it certainly helps by starting off with, oh, are you, are you comfortable with this? Um, I, I use condoms for protection. What's your preferred method of contraception? Why does it have to be more complicated than that? It doesn't have to be a big, burdensome conversation. It just has to be direct, straightforward, and to the point. I find that using very clear, simplistic language, rather than trying to make it sexy and fun, is actually the way to go when you're first learning how to have those conversations. Get those language skills down first, and then you can worry about infusing them in a more efficacious and sexier way. Just to have the conversation for starters, and that's where it really begins. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. And I think it's it's awesome that you work with your clients to make sure they're asking for your consent and that you're asking for theirs. And that the, the situation that you've created inside of the, the world that you've created for these people in this experience is very similar to what they would see outside of it. And I think that's important to know. Yeah. It's a very real, it's very, very realistic. This isn't some staged mock sex experience. No, we're, we're going out on a date just like anybody else would go out on a date. Mm-hmm. The only thing that's different is that I'm a little bit more self-aware than most people are of my personal needs, wants, and desires. And I'm probably going to be a more efficacious communicator than the average person would. Yeah. You know you mentioned contraception, and I just uh, made me curious. Uh, how do women that work there handle contraception? I know everyone, you always use condoms and protection, but do you feel the need to go an extra level and have an IUD or be on birth control or another level of protection? Um, I'm actually too tiny to take, to take birth control, believe it or not. It causes an almost overdose type reaction in me. And so I'm not able to take birth control, even though I certainly would like to for more of a hormonal regulation standpoint. But it certainly isn't something that I feel like I must do because of this job. Condoms are certainly an adequate form of protection for most individuals. However, a lot of ladies are able to take birth control and do so, not because of this job, but they may do so for other reasons, such as hormonal regulation, personal relationships, etc. Yeah. Wait, I was just curious. Yeah. You talked a little bit earlier, I know we're kind of bouncing all over the place, but whatever, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about your exploration and, and the progressions that you've gone through in exploring BDSM, BDSM and kink. Is there something that's that's on your bucket list that you still haven't checked off yet that you're you're hoping to someday? Yes, I want to suspend somebody from a fifty foot crane. Wow, that's ambitious and amazing. <laughs> yep, that's it's going to take. A little, okay, it's going to take a heck of a lot of coordination, like a crash net and safety equipment, and I'm going to need to get a crane and somebody that's not afraid of heights. But I have an image in my head that I've always wanted to capture of somebody suspended in a very, very elegant position where their head is aimed at the ground, kind of almost um, similar to that of the hanged man on the tarot card. 
<laughs> kind of like that kind of imagery, I think would be really sexy to capture. Something about that and being able to make that happen is definitely on my personal kinky bucket list. <laughs> yeah, I think that's... Because you a- figure when, well, you're a sex worker, the bucket list gets pretty damn interesting. It's yeah. like, oh, orgy, orgy in a limo? Check that one off. Having a naked pool party? Can check that one off. Having an encounter with three of my best friends at the same time? Can check that one off. Role play? Done. Schoolgirls? Done. BDSM and kink? Done. Mm-hmm. I've gotten to do so many interesting sexual things that I honestly have struggled to come up with what's even on my bucket list anymore. Yeah. What's your favorite toy that you found? Oh, Hitachi Magic Wand, hands down. I love the fact that they have corded as well as cordless options available now. I mean, the settings are strong and stronger. What's yes. not to love about that? <laughs> I would it's, agree. That's my favorite, too. <laughs> oh, it, it just, it works. I mean, if, if you don't own a sex toy at home, ladies, get yourself a magic wand. It It's a good one. Yes. I had another question. Can I, can I ask another one? Yeah, go ahead. Um, have you ever, and this is again, a very specific thing. Have you ever been working with a client? Maybe it it was a guy or a girl, I suppose, uh, um, a man or a woman and their partner found out about it. And then rather than cutting it off, they started seeing you together as a couple. Yes. And in fact, I actually do have an example of this. Um, I always like to mention that I only talk about experiences and clients that have specifically given their consent to be discussed. So this is a story that I have full permission to share, much like the other ones I've spoken about on this podcast. I I don't want anyone feeling as if their life story is going to be aired on the next podcast if they come to see me. Unless you specifically give consent for that, I don't talk about any encounters. Um, With this particular one, it was a gentleman. He started to see me, and he he did mention that he was married up front, and he mentioned that there were some difficulties regarding sex in the relationship, but didn't really go into too much detail. During our first encounter, it eventually came to light that his wife did not know that he was there and that his wife was actually struggling with cancer at the moment and that she physically wasn't able to have sex with him. Um, She happened to call during the middle of our session and it was because of a medical emergency. She asked where he was and he was truthful and honest with her like I hope most spouses are. And she was like, okay, we'll talk about this more later. Well, he went and handled the medical issue, and she wrote me the most interesting email I've ever come across talking about the fact that she was perfectly okay with the fact that he was doing this. She was more so hurt by the fact that he didn't communicate his needs rather than taking care of them with her consent, doing it behind her back. In all reality, she was perfectly comfortable with him getting his primary sex need fulfilled at a brothel because at the time she's undergoing chemotherapy, she literally could not have sex. So instead, I I came up with a solution for this. And the solution looked like having her come into the session as a non-sexual participant. She was still involved, but not in a PIV context. She was still able to be there emotionally with her husband, kissing, making out, rubbing on his shoulders. She was able to be engaged and involved in a way that worked for her and her physiology at the time. Now, I'm so happy to say she's in remission, and now they come out every single year on the anniversary of her remission date to have a really fun orgy. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah, that's a really cool story. Yeah, no, that's... When I asked that question, I wasn't expecting such an amazing answer, so I (laughs) I appreciate it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. the, the Bunny Ranch changes lives in so many ways that people don't realize. They think of it as just being sex, but it's... God, it's just so much more than that when you really take a look at the work we do. It's veterans coming back and feeling supported. It's couples healing their broken relationships. It's virgins getting that sex education up front so this way they don't commit a violation of consent later down the road. We're actively working to make sex better for America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... 
you you don't have to convince us. We're, no. we're happy to support that any any way yes. we can. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, I, you mentioned that your family is very supportive. Uh, so they they know. I'm assuming what you do in your in your line of work. Um, have you? Do most of your friends know, or most of your friends, I guess that you've made now through work? Or, Literally or, every single person in my life, from the person who does my hair, my best friend, my family, my doctor, my dog babysitter, everybody knows what I do. I have no problems with disclosure. And frankly, if someone has a problem about what I do and isn't willing to have a conversation about it, that's probably not somebody I want in my life anyway. Mm-hmm. When it comes to family, um, it, it's so interesting. They were actually relieved that I was working at the Bunny Ranch. Prior, I had worked as a jockey at the Belmont Racetrack, which is an incredibly physically dangerous job. They were just so happy that I wasn't dealing with the horses anymore. They're like, oh, the Bunny Ranch, that sounds so nice. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. Yes, we support oh. this. Never get on a thoroughbred again. Now, that's not because oh they thought gosh. you were working with bunnies, right? Oh, gosh. No, they, they knew what the Bunny Ranch okay. was. <laughs> so, a, a funny story to kind of riff off of that. Um, I have a pony who lives at the Bunny Ranch. And I had a company pick him up and trailer him to the ranch from California. And they did think it was a rabbit farm. They were so (laughs) confused when they pulled in. They're like, I think I'm here, but this isn't a rabbit farm. I'm like, you are here. And there are no rabbits here. Only bunnies. (laughs) I got my pony unloaded off of the trailer, got him situated. And the fellow actually went inside and ended up going on a tour of the place. It was wow. really, really funny, in fact. It was like three in the morning in the middle of winter. The poor guy got delayed at the pass from California to Nevada because it oh, oftentimes man. snows. And so he didn't get in until it seriously was like 3 a.m. So he was very, very confused driving up with, you know, the bright lights and this, you know. And so I'm sure this guy had a lot of very interesting thoughts running through his head, like, oh my God, what is happening here? Where am I? Wow. That's hilarious. <laughs> so I, I think maybe, unless Emma's got a, a lot more questions, we could start to wrap it up. I had yeah. a final question. Yeah, no, I think it, we should go. Uh, obviously, you don't sound like you're anywhere near retirement. Do you mind talking a little bit about what your goals are, maybe, where you see yourself going and and what you think things look like for you in the coming months and years? So one of my long-term goals, when I do eventually choose to retire from full-service sex work at the Bunny Ranch, I really want to dedicate my life to being a sex work advocate. I really would like to get a PPE degree from Oxford. Uh, It's an amazing way to kind of get introduced to politics. It's a philosophy, politics, and economics would be the degree. And it's oftentimes one that politicians will choose to do. By no means do I want to be a politician, but I think I need to understand the legal language and the legal perceptions a little bit better because one of my long-term goals is to start advocating for and making nationwide legalization a reality. I think it starts at a county-by-county level by petitioning at that point and then moving from state to state. I'd really like to work with some of the marijuana advocates and talk to them about the roads that they have gone down to get to where they are now with national-level legalization imminent. That's where I really hope to take sex work long-term. Um, for me, I see myself continuing to work down that path. Well, at the same time, I want to develop some sort of sex education that's readily accessible to people. I've been doing that already somewhat through my own podcast and through my Coffee with Alice morning show. But I think as life goes on, I want to be able to do it in an even bigger and broader way. It's such an important message to get out there that I want it to be heard from the rooftops, if at all possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's that's amazing. Yeah, that sounds incredible. And and maybe before we let you go, you mentioned now uh, Coffee Talk with Alice and a podcast. Do you mind, for anybody who wants to 
maybe get more Alice but can't make it out to the bunny ranch or doesn't deliver ponies for a living, <laughs> what are what are some ways that they can can find you or interact with you? The first way is going to be through my personal website, which is thealicelittle.com. Second, you can find me on social media, Twitter at the Alice Little, and also at the Alice Little on Instagram. I'm also on FetLife for all you kinky people out there as the Alice Little. I'm fairly easy to find by Googling, and my podcast should be coming out here pretty soon. I've got some really interesting topics lined up, and I'm hoping people will enjoy what they hear. Excellent. Well, we will we'll put links to all of that, and when your podcast launches, we'll go back and edit it so people can find it. So shouldn't have any troubles with yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Um, awesome. And I always like to give my email address, too, alicelittle at bunnyranch.com. And I invite people to email me with questions, with comments. If you have some personal concerns about legalized sex work that you'd like to have answered, talk to me. I'm here, and I want to be able to have those conversations with people. And of course, for anyone that's interested in seeing me in person, the best way to is going to be through email. So I just thought of one more quick question. <laughs> we've, we've been asking our, our guests lately one blooper that they've had from either that either happened to them or because of them with within like the sexual realm of things. So I imagine it doesn't always go perfect. So if there's one that you're able to share, we'd love to hear it. Oh, man. So at one point, I had a request for a very specific fetish that involved riding an inflatable pool raft, specifically a whale. Um, apparently, they wanted it to be a sperm whale inflatable, not a blue whale inflatable. And they didn't discuss this first. And it was apparently such a specific fantasy that the only way we were able to make it happen was to retrofit the wrong inflatable with various fins and parts that I printed out on sheets of paper and just kind of duct tape on there to make it look more like a blue whale. It was hilarious. The tape would not stay on this damn thing to save my life. It was just a train wreck. It was so funny. We were both just cracking up by the end of it. And hilariously enough, as a thank you present, they decided to send me a whole collection of whale figurines. Wow. So I guess that highlights the importance of consent and discussing what you want in the to bedroom. very specific to details. Very specific. Yes. <laughs> if, if the specifics matter to you, all you have to do is discuss them. As far as a non-sexual blooper at the Bunny Ranch, um, I was thrown on camera by my pony. He got startled by one of the boom mics that they were using while I was filming with Nightline. And he comes around the corner, comes to a dead stop, and I just kept going right over his head oh geez. you were kind enough to not use the footage at least but man did i feel like such a ditz yeah. thanks well, merlin for making me look good <laughs> as, as someone who's been thrown off of a horse twice <laughs> i refuse to ride them as much as possible so <laughs> I, you just have aversion to horses now and they don't like me either so it's <laughs> it's mutual oh were you okay? Well, I should ask that. Were, were you pleasure. okay when that oh, happened? Oh, yeah. I bounced okay. right back up. Good. <laughs> it was just more so ego was bruised more than anything else yeah. in that case. Yeah. Excellent. Well, happy to hear you were safe, and and we're happy for everything you've created, and we're happy to support you. So thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for spending your evening with us and all the fantastic information. I think it's really exciting, and hopefully everyone will enjoy it. Oh, and, yes. and learn Thank something. Thank you so much for having me. I really That's, appreciate it. Absolutely. It's us again. 
Hello. <laughs> we wanted to, of course, thank Alice for taking time out of her busy schedule to come on the show and share a little bit about what she does and her story with everyone. We hope you found it fascinating. We also wanted to quickly remind you to please, if you have a minute, it would be great if you could contact the commissioners that we talked about at the beginning of the show. Uh, just it would really mean a lot. And um, it only takes a couple minutes to send them in a quick email. Yeah, and also one last thing we wanted to mention, as always, there's always more with us. Um, (laughs) We have another, uh, we mentioned last week that uh, the STD Test Express website is no longer existing and that we replaced it with stdcheck.com. So give those guys a, a look. It's a great way to quick and easy and relatively cheap get your all of your STD tests done. Uh, you don't necessarily have to get them weekly like Alice and her co-workers at the Bunny Ranch, but <laughs> I mean, I would say every other week's more appropriate. Probably, depending on how active you are. <laughs> and the last one is, if you want to reach out to us and see some fun pictures of the two of us, head over to Cassidy. If you don't have a Cassidy account, uh, you can use the links on our show notes or in the resources page to get a 30-day free trial and see all the goodness that Cassidy has to offer. Yep, and a quick reminder, you can find our show notes, which include the links to the commissioners, on our webpage, which is normalizingnonmonogamy.com. And we will see you Wednesday for our regularly scheduled programming with The Two Married Sluts. Yeah, that'll be a fun interview. It it already was a fun interview. I know, it is. All right, (laughs) you ready to go? Yeah. All right. Bye, everyone.